All right, today we are diving into the engine room of biology itself. We're talking about glycolysis. It's this amazing 10-step process that takes the sugar you eat and boom, turns it into instant energy for your cells. So come on, let's step onto the factory floor and see exactly how this whole thing works. I mean, have you ever really thought about it? You take a bite of, I don't know, a piece of fruit, and almost instantly you feel that rush, that burst of energy. How in the world does your body turn that fuel into action so fast? Well, it's not magic, not at all. It's actually a perfectly orchestrated, super efficient biological assembly line. And the answer to that question? It isn't some far off concept. It is literally happening inside almost every single cell in your body, right now as you're listening to this. We're talking about the absolute bedrock of how life powers itself. This is the process that gives us our energy for life. So at its core, glycolysis is actually pretty straightforward. You take one molecule of glucose, that's our six carbon sugar, and put it through this 10 step process. And what comes out the other end? Two smaller three carbon molecules called pyruvate. And the whole operation, the entire assembly line, it takes place on the main factory floor of the cell, which we call the cytosol. Now, here's what's truly mind-blowing about this whole thing. It's how universal it is. Glycolysis isn't just a human thing. Nope, we're talking nearly every living organism on the planet, from the tiniest bacteria all the way up to us. And get this, for some of our super specialized cells, like the ones in your retina, glycolysis is the only way they can make their energy. It's their sole source for that all-important energy currency, ATP. Okay, so to really get how this factory turns a profit, we've got to look at it in two main phases. And phase one, it's all about the investment. Because you know the old saying, you got to spend money to make money? Well, the cell lives by that rule. It knows it needs to put in a little bit of energy up front to get a much bigger payoff later. So this whole investment phase, it really has just two main jobs on its to-do list. First, get the raw material, that glucose, inside the factory and lock the doors so it can't get out. And second, tweak it. Get it prepped and ready for the main event, which is splitting it right in half. And it all kicks off with this enzyme called hexokinase. You can think of it like the bouncer at the factory door. As soon as glucose comes in, hexokinase slaps a phosphate group on it. This gives the glucose a negative charge. And because of that, there's no way it can sneak back out through the cell membrane. It's trapped. It's officially on the assembly line. All right, a couple steps down the line, we meet the factory's real foreman. This is the key enzyme, PFK1, and its job is to add a second phosphate group. And this step, folks, this is the real point of no return. Once PFK1 does its thing, that glucose molecule is all in. It's committed. There is no turning back now. It's going all the way through the glycolysis pathway. And right there, that's the investment we were talking about. Each of those phosphate groups didn't come from nowhere they were taken from an ATP molecule. So to trap the glucose and get it ready, the cell just spent two units of its precious ATP. The investment has been made. But don't worry, that investment is about to pay off. And I mean big time. We're now entering phase two of glycolysis, the energy payoff. This is where the cell finally starts to see a return. It's time to cash in. And here it is, the pivotal moment. In step four, an enzyme called aldolase comes in and acts like a molecular cleaver. With one swift move, it splits that six carbon sugar right down the middle. Bam! We now have two separate three carbon molecules. And that split right there, that is the absolute key to the payoff. Why? Because now we have two three carbon molecules to work with. That means from this point forward, every single step happens twice in parallel. It's like our factory just opened up a second assembly line, effectively doubling our production capacity. So what does this big payoff actually look like? Well, first up, in step six, we generate a super valuable, energy-rich molecule called NADH. You can think of it like a high-powered, rechargeable battery the cell can use later. Then, in step seven, the factory makes its first ATP directly. It's like getting a direct deposit of cash. And finally, in the very last step, we get a second ATP molecule the exact same way. And don't forget, all of this is happening on both assembly lines at the same time. Okay, let's do the math here. Each of our two assembly lines produce two ATP. So two times two, that gives us a gross profit of four ATP. Not bad at all. And we can't forget about our other valuable product. 
we also walked away with two molecules of NADH. Remember, those are our high energy batteries that the cell can cash in for a whole lot more ATP down the road if the conditions are right. All right, time for the final tally. Let's look at the balance sheet. We spent two ATP in the investment phase. We gained four ATP in the payoff phase, so four minus two, that leaves us with a net profit of two ATP for every single glucose molecule that went in. Plus, we've got those two NADH molecules as a nice little bonus. That's a quick, clean, efficient profit. So, the assembly line has cranked out its final product, two molecules of pyruvate. But wait, the story isn't over, not by a long shot. Pyruvate is now standing at a fork in the road, a crucial decision point. And the path it takes next depends entirely on one single thing. Is there any oxygen around? Okay, so if oxygen is available, we call this the aerobic path, the cell goes for the grand prize. Pyruvate heads into the cell's power plants, the mitochondria. There it gets converted into something called acetyl-CoA, which is basically a ticket to the next big show, the TCA cycle, where it gets completely oxidized for a massive, massive energy yield. But if there's no oxygen, the anaerobic path, the game changes. The new goal is simple. Just keep glycolysis running no matter what. So in our muscles, when you're working out hard, that pyruvate becomes lactate. You know that burn you feel? That's it. And in yeast, it becomes ethanol. Yep, that's literally fermentation in action. Now, obviously, a factory this critical to survival can't just be left to run wild 24-7. That'd be incredibly wasteful. You need a really smart control system, a management team to regulate production, to crank it up when you need more energy and dial it way down when you don't. And that control system really boils down to three key managers, three enzymes that run the irreversible steps we talked about. You can think of them as the main control knobs on the whole assembly line. You've got hexokinase, the bouncer at the start. You've got our foreman, PFK1, who's the main on-off switch. And then you have pyruvate kinase, which is like the final quality check at the very end. So. How does this actually play out? Let's take a simple scenario. Imagine the cell is just chilling out, it's got plenty of energy, its ATP levels are high. Does the factory just keep pointlessly burning through valuable glucose? No way, the cell is way smarter than that. High levels of ATP, the factory's final product, actually act as a stop signal. The extra ATP molecules go back and bind to our main foreman, PFK1, and basically tell it to take a break. This slows the whole assembly line down to a crawl. It's a beautiful, elegant feedback system that makes sure the cell only makes what it needs and conserves fuel for later. And that really brings us to a final, pretty profound thought. This exact 10-step recipe for making energy, it's one of the oldest, most conserved processes in all of biology. The fact that you, right now, and some tiny bacterium living in the dirt are using this fundamentally same playbook to power yourselves that's an incredible testament to our deep shared evolutionary history. So what does that ancient universal connection really tell us about the story of life? Now that is something to chew on.